The following story has been brought to you by storiestoinspire.org. I wasn't born a rabbi. People think that rabbis literally come out with a gemara on the one hand and a little bit of a beard and a pair of glasses on the other hand and a tie that's generally a... That's not true. Matter of fact, I tell you the honest truth at Chata'ai Ani Mazker Hayom. In, in high school, I wasn't really so much of rabbi material. At least it didn't seem that way at that time. And today, even when I bump into some of my rebbies of many good years ago, they still look at me and they take a second and third look and they blink and then, it's you. I'd like to tell you, at that time in high school, yes, as an American boy, growing up in Flatbush in the Murray Yeshiva nonetheless there was so much so many tests so many difficulties I got caught up into so much shtuyot at that time and I'm thinking to myself you know that was then years ago today today do you know what our kids are going up against in high school our young men our young ladies today the tests are a thousand time fold I remember in my day at that time, if, if, if a guy was caught going to the movies, ooh, that's it. He's done. The movies? Oh, forget it. They're going to throw him out of yeshiva. They're going to this and they're going to that. And today? Ha, I don't know. I can't say for Hashanah all the high schools, but at least the high school we teach him, if a guy's caught going to the movies... We're not going to give him a hazaku baruch, but uh, we say to ourselves, at least he's not doing this and this and this and this. And today, what they're going up against, our kids, is beyond imagination. The tests are overwhelming, especially at such a young age today. Today, they walk around with the ability, they have devices that they can reach. With a touch of a button, any part of the world. Chas v'shalom. And these are young, young, young boys. Our young ladies as well. So, you can imagine. You can imagine how much si'ata d'shmaya you need to really be able to get through Galut America today. And I'm talking from the time I was back in high school. And at that time, as I mentioned, I didn't really do that much learning. I was into all different types of crazy stuff and martial arts and I thought I was going to be the next Bruce Lee and don't ask, it was ridiculous now that I looked back at it but at the time to me it was the biggest wow and then finally my father took me out of Brooklyn sent me out of town and I went to Edison Yeshiva and it was the, actually the first year that I really began to learn and when I began to start tasting, learning, there was a Rebbe there, Rebero Shacha, who was a, a giant of a Gaon. And I stalked him. I stalked him day and night. And he used to give shiur in the morning. And in the afternoon, they used to learn Bikiyut. I wouldn't even go to the Bikiyut. I would go back and I'd bang on the Rebbe's door and i said, Rebbe, I have another question. Rebbe, I have another question. Rebbe, I have another question. And I used to drive him crazy. But it wouldn't let up. I finally found learning. I found the taste of something that was real. Something that brought real fulfillment. That brought real chayim. And I enjoyed it. And that year, the first year out of high school, first year Bet Midrash, out of town, was a great year of learning for me. That summer, my father decided that he wanted to give me, I guess, a thumbs up, an incentive for a year of real learning that he was so proud of. So he allowed me, I couldn't go to camp because like this year, Tisha B'Av ended so late, this man ended, starts so early, there was only two, three weeks in between, how much can you do? My father said, you know what? I'm gonna let you go to Israel. Two, three weeks, vacation. I said, okay, Abba, wow, I'd love to go. My grandmother, Ali Shalom, at that time was still alive. She was living in Israel. I wanted to see her. I said, Abba, I, 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 so I'm ready to go. I, I, I would love to go. 
And I got on that plane and I went. And it was vacation. I went with a suitcase with sweatpants and t-shirts. That's it. Vacation, vacation. I landed. I went out that night to the hotel. I was there for only two and a half some odd weeks. Went that night to the hotel. And I'm praying our beat. And I bump into an old friend of mine from Brooklyn. And like I bump into the guy, middle of our beat. And he looks at me. And I look at him. And I'm looking at him like, what are you doing here? And he's looking at me in my sweatpants, in my sweatshirt, in my, in, 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 in my Nikes. And he's, he's saying, what are you doing here? Like, and I said, I'm here on vacation for two weeks. I had a good year. My father wanted to give me a Hazaku Baruch trip. So I'm here. He says, uh, wow, very nice. I said, what are you doing here? He says, I learned here. I said, really? Where do you learn? And he tells me this yeshiva. I want, I want, I want you to come over tonight. You got to check out this place. I said, what's there to check out? It's a yeshiva. I came from a yeshiva. I'm very happy in the yeshiva. I finally found my yeshiva, my rebbe's. Everything's great. I'm on vacation. I came to Israel. I just wanted to go and lay on my back in the Dead Sea for two weeks and not even come out of the water. That's it. That's all I wanted. I'll float out to Jordan. Excitement. That's all. He says, no, 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 no. Just come tonight. I'm telling you, you like yeshiva, you like the rabbis. It's okay. That night, I come into this Israeli yeshiva. I'm looking around. And you can imagine, again, I'm in my t-shirt and sweatpants. They're looking at me like an American Baal Teshuvah. And they're talking to me, you know, and they're trying to tell me about mitzvot. And this is Shabbat. And I'm me, I'm playing along. Really? No, Kolakaba, really, baby. And he's like, Lula. I said, something go with that. I throw it, throw it. Wow. And I'm, I'm going along with them. And I'm, and I'm loving it because my mash, they think like I'm, I'm religious for 20 seconds. Till finally I look at the front and I see there's a rabbi sitting in the front. His face, his face looked like the old giants of the European Jewry that was wiped out of yesteryear. He didn't look like he was from this generation. I turned to my friend, I said to him, who's that malach, who's that, who's that, who's that rabbi in the front? He says, that? That is the great Diane Fisher. He's one of the greatest Geonim, one of the biggest Gedolim in, the, in, in Israel. I said, wow, look at him. That's a rabbi I'd love to learn by. I said, who's the rabbi sitting next to him? That's from Yaakov Kamenetsky's son. He's one of the Rosh HaYeshivot here in this yeshiva in Israel. I said, the Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky? He said, yeah. I said, wow, what type of lineup do you have here? And he says, you see there on the other side? That's from Michal Zilber. He is the rabbi that was known to be from a young child prodigy. He's the one that Rabbi Huttner said that he is the genius of the generation at the age of 17. The one that did the tapes on all of Shas in different languages. He knows the entire Shas by heart. Wow. What do you feed these guys? How do you have such giants in one room? Under one roof? I said, I just can't download this. This is unbelievable. Wow. I went over. I don't know what possessed me. I walked over in my hard rock t-shirt and sweatpants with Nikes to the one and only Dying Fisher himself. And I kissed his hand and I said, Harav, I'm from America. I'm here for two weeks. I'm supposed to be on vacation. I'm ready to drop it all. I just want to learn with you. And he looked up at me in my broken Hebrew. And he smiled. He didn't really get what I was saying because my Hebrew was horrific. So I turned around and I said it again in Yiddish. Then he jumps up and he looks at me and he says to me, what? Swaradi boy from America that speaks Yiddish but doesn't speak Hebrew? It has to be that the times of Mashiach is here, he tells me. He said to me, okay, you, I'll learn with you. That next morning, I'm learning with Diane Fisher. First Seder, I was learning with the son of Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky. And 
I'm learning in this yeshiva with giants. Bechavruta. And I was like, I, I couldn't deal with it. And I'm showing up every day with sweat. That's all I had. Till I finally went out and I splurged and I bought myself a white button-down shirt with sweatpants, of course. And, 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 and I came to yeshiva with the Israelis for two weeks. No Dead Sea, no Masada, no Tel Aviv, no beach, nothing. Because when you find an opportunity, how in the world are you out of your mind not to show up? Show up? At the end of those two weeks, it came the day of truth. The day that I had to pack up and go home. The day that my ticket, my return flight. Oh, yeah, yeah, what a day. I remember I called up my father on the telephone, Siburi. We're talking about good years ago, where there still was a concept called public pay phones. And I called up my father, collect. And I said, uh, Abba, hi, it's Dovi. Uh, I'm supposed to be coming home tonight. He says, yeah, that's right. Two weeks, that's it. Your yeshiva is waiting for you. Your Rebbe, remember how good of a year you had last year? You finally found the place. You finally are learning. I said, yeah, Abba, I know. But um, I don't know how to explain this to you. Don't get upset. And uh, let me try to just get this out till the end. And then you can say no. Abba, I'm sitting and learning with giants. Please, I'm begging you. You're an accountant. You understand what it means to file for an extension. I'm filing for a 30-day extension. I'm begging you, please, let me stay here for just a little, for just 30 days. After that, Abba, I'm telling you not a word. Sukkot, I'm home. I will push my ticket off. Come back to America. Go back to the yeshiva there in America that I was in. Just pick up from the year. Abba, I can't describe to you who I'm learning with. I'm learning with Diane Fisher. I'm bringing him his, his breakfast every morning. I'm learning with Yaakov Kamenetsky's son, Remichel Zilber. These are giants. I can't not look. Stop. Please, let me just stay just for an Elul. There's silence on the phone. That's not a good sign. I was waiting for my father's hand to come through the receiver long distance and grab me and stop shaking and say, Get on the plane! But then suddenly a very soft voice came over the waves. And he said, I don't know why I'm saying this. But I'm going to let you stay for 30 days. But that's it. I don't want to hear nothing at the end of Elul. I don't want to hear nothing. I'll have mommy send you some clothes. For what I understand, you're walking around Israel in a white button-down shirt and sweatpants with sneakers. You're embarrassing the family. <laughs> Go get yourself dressed. 30 days, that's it. You're home. I said, okay. Abba, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was a Ness. You don't know my father. This was a Ness. I'm telling you. This was a Ness. My father has a right hook. This is one of his fingers. One. He has another five like these. I was pachat. If you want to talk about the fear. But this fear of the opportunity being lost was greater to me. And I stayed at Elul. And I knew that this Elul might be the last Elul I ever spend in Israel. Definitely in the presence of these giants. To me, that Elul was an opportunity. To me, that Elul was the fear of missing an opportunity. I was trying my best to use every second, every minute. Now, in the yeshiva world, you should know, in real yeshiva, Elul is such a great concept. In Elul, in Yeshiva, nobody leaves the entire month. Nobody leaves. The guys that go away to Israel, they'll tell you, and even the seminary girls that go to Israel will tell you, that there are certain weeks 
that you must stay in school, in yeshiva, certain Shabbatot, they're out Shabbat. You go to people, they're all, you know, the Americans in Harnoff are always inviting over all the students to come for Shabbat. You go out here, you go out there, you get great meals, you feed yourself up, you come back to school, you come back to yeshiva. Elul, no such thing. Elul, nobody leaves. Because every second counts. Because it's an opportunity of every single minute. It's a time that Hashem is giving and giving and giving. How could you not be taking? Forget about Walmart. We're talking about Ribbon Osha Olam. 30 days. This is it. Doors are closing. What an opportunity. Nobody leaves Elul. And I didn't leave either. And that's... That's when he shows up. Three weeks into Elul, I was having the Zman of my life. It was like almost not real. And I get a phone call. One of the Israeli guys comes into Yeshiva one night and he tells me, Dubi. I mean, they couldn't say my name. Forget it. You have a phone, you know, you have a yeah, phone call. I said, Me? Nobody even knows I'm here. I ran out to the phone, I pick up the phone, it was my uncle who lives in Jerusalem. My uncle says to me, uh, Shalom, David, I just wanted to tell you that your aunt from France, she just came to Jerusalem this afternoon. She's here by me tonight. She hasn't seen you since your bar mitzvah. She really wants you to come over tonight. I said, uh, oh boy. How long is she staying for? Tomorrow she's going back. Oh boy, tomorrow she's going back. And I'm thinking to myself, Elul, I can't leave Yeshiva. Nobody leaves Elul. And then suddenly I remembered, wait, this aunt, this is the one aunt in the family that actually has money. Oh boy, this is the aunt that I remember. She gave me a thousand dollar gift for my bar mitzvah. I remember this aunt. And now she shows up, middle of Elul, in Jerusalem, third week. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, but it's, you know, and you'll be able to go out and buy clothes, and she's gonna, you'll go for only 10 minutes, and she'll stop a uh, check in your pocket, and then you'll walk out, and. Uh, I had 20 different excuses why to go. And I told my uncle, listen, I don't know how you're going to explain this to her. I don't think I can explain it to her. But I'm here in Yeshiva in Israel for 30 days. It's Elul. Nobody leaves Elul. <sighs> Apologize. I just can't come. He says to me, are you sure? Because, you know, he knows what I know, what he knows, what I know, what he knows. I said, yeah, I can't come. I can't come. I just can't come. I can't come. And I hung up. And I had a heavy heart. And I felt bad. But it was what it was. And that was it. I finished off this month. This month of my life. Get on a plane as promised. Came home for Sukkot. I am now home, Sukkot. And I could see my father's looking at me and he's not bringing up the subject. He doesn't want to know what happened. He doesn't want to bring up Israel because he knows what's going to take up from there. I said, Abba, I told you, my word is my word. That's it. What can I say? What else can I say? I was sitting with him in the sukkah one night and he turns to me and nobody else was there. And he says to me, Dovi, uh... I spoke to my sister today from France. I said, oh boy. <laughs> Here it comes. Right away I said, Abba, listen, let me, let me explain. Uh, the truth is, I, I, I know it was terrible. And, and she doesn't understand that maybe I should have spoke to her straight. That maybe I should have went. But, but it was Elul. It was my only Elul. And we don't leave Elul. And, and the opportunity. He says, no, 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 no. She understood. She understood perfectly. A matter of fact, I also understand. I understand, my father says to me, I understand that you need to go back. I bought you a ticket. You're going back. I went back for one year, 
three years, four years, then came back to America, found my Eshet Hayel Na Shamayim, went back to Israel again for two, three, four years in Kolel, and was lucky enough to get that opportunity because of one El. And this is a drop in the bucket. Each person has their Elu opportunity story. How one Elu came and changed their path, their direction, their life forever. Why? Because this month represents the time before creation. The time that Hashem wants to be metiv. There's such siyata deshmaya available to you this month. There's such ratzon available to you this month. You just have to develop the ratzon to want to be big. To want to be a big person. To want to be someone great. To tell Hashem what you'd love to be. What you always wanted to be. Certain character traits to get rid of. Certain character traits to be able to finally find and develop. This is the month. Don't sleep through Elul. Dream through Elul. And then, and then there's the Ratzon, finally, that's given to us from Hashem. As we have our Ratzon to want to become big and great people. People that are going to spread Kabod Shamayim. There's the Ratzon of Hashem and our Ratzon. Like a Chatan in Kala, the Chatan who wants to give so much. And the Kala that's receiving in such a loving way. That's why the month is called Elul. Ani ledodi vidodi li. There it is. The whole speech is just in the name. I am to my beloved and my beloved is to me. In what way? Hashem says, my beloved, I'm here with Ratzon to give you. With so, so much siyata dishmaya is available to you in this month. If you appreciate how much siyata dishmaya is available to you this month, you'll appreciate the fear of missing this opportunity. Don't sleep through Elul. Dream through Elul. Take the Ratzon that Hashem is giving us now. Develop our Ratzon to become a big and great person. Then comes Roshana. And that's the moment that Hashem says, we're going to put our Ritzonot together. You have a deal for a coming year. Thank you for listening. Enjoyed this story? Come again. Bring a friend. Stories to inspire.org.